I come home to report on the killing of Yusuf Mackey in one of Manchester's richest neighbourhoods. What I'd never expected to uncover was a growing culture of middle-class kids carrying knives as a way of life. I've got talking to these lads just down the road from where Yusuf was stabbed. Like, we're stood in Hale town centre right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, I know. And I'm getting the sense that you don't feel safe right now. It's, it's not safe anywhere at the minute. They start arguing with people because you got born. They carry on and then they say, watch this, we're outside. And then they find you and then something bad happens to you. So there's a group of people coming down. Are there, mm -hmm. are they friends or...? Oh, no. That's the people I'm beefing pretty much. Their story was similar to others that I'd heard, but just as we were finishing up, the atmosphere changed. Do we need to be careful? No, what do you think? So can you stall it a bit? That doesn't wait Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were being asked to keep filming as a sort of protection from some of the other lads that were heading our way. Have you got issues? Yeah, he's oh. actually carrying the knife. He wants to be a mobile. Why have you got beef with him? Oh, I thought they'll do it if you give us a call. Yeah, we need to just be aware of your safety, that's all. Because we don't know whether they'll do anything or not. Hello. You all right? Yeah, man, um, do it. We just want to watch, innit? No, no, I know. I just need to... Maybe you could walk with me where I need to go. I only want to ask, like, one or two more questions. Yeah. Come here, you all right? He's with us. Oh, yeah, he was... He was... not with them, he's with us. Come, stay with us, stay with us, who was with us. It's all right. Stay, stay close to me. Even after all I'd been told, it was still crazy to think that boys as young as this might be carrying knives for status. Uh, I just wanted to see what he waffled about, because he'd never carry these kind of stupid. <laughs> But it was what I would uncover next that would turn this idea of middle-class wannabes completely on its head. All right, let's get out of here. Welcome to July in Manchester. I'd heard that Josh Molner, the lad who'd been acquitted of Yusuf's murder, was back in court. I was hoping I'd finally get to meet the person I'd heard so much about. But more importantly, to find out why, less than 12 months after his acquittal, he was back in front of a judge. So that was Josh Molner, who just came hand in hand with his mum, Stephanie. Uh, he's changed his hair since the last time I saw him. On the grapevine, I've been told it is something to do with possession of a knife. And the cogs just started turning in my head. Judging by the press outside the court, I wasn't the only person in Manchester who wanted to know what Josh had been up to. So Josh is in court for possession of a bladed article and he was also found in possession of a stolen item. What's really significant is that this is linked to an incident that happened 13 days before Yusuf's killing. So it sounds to me like the police were aware of Joshua before Yusuf stabbing. So it is concerning that during a murder trial, this was never brought to light. Because this feels low level, but it doesn't in the context. 
and the prosecution. Yeah, they're coming. They're coming. Hello, have you got five minutes for a quick chat tour, please? So Josh didn't want to talk to me. And it was going to be a while before he'd have to answer any questions. He wanted the case to be heard in front of a jury, and that meant it would be months before I'd find out the full story behind these charges. Discovering that Josh might have been involved with knives and stolen property just days before the death of Yusuf was at odds with the version of him that had been presented by his defence team at his murder trial. But then they'd argued that the videos of him with knives were just ridiculous posing, influenced by the drill music that he was listening to. But now I was wondering if there was more to it than that. I wanted to know what was going on in Josh's life in the weeks running up to the killing. So do you remember Henry? He told me about a posh party scene that Yusuf and Josh were part of. Big eye houses, big curly stairways. And stuff. Like, they all have bounces and, <laughs> bounces and stuff. Like bounces? Yeah, yeah, I swear I don't. Maybe these nights at parties could give me some clues about what had been going on. I found someone who was a part of that scene. He didn't want to meet, but said that we could chat on the phone. I don't know who he knew, whether it was Yusuf himself or some of the other lads, but it sounds like he was connected in some way. Hi, Amber here. I was really interested to ask you, actually, about this party scene. If I was ever a party on a weekend, there'd always be this massive group of lads uh, who would just show up. Every weekend without fail, in like a group of like 30, 40 people, which included Josh and sometimes included Lisa, and want to get in and want to have fights. Right. And when Josh would turn up to these parties, what kind of stuff would he do? It was known that Josh was doing a lot of drugs. He'd kick off and like maybe break things outside, be shouting until someone went out to confront him. And uh, I remember literally weeks before the incident with Yusuf, they came to a party we were at and uh, one of our mates talked to Yusuf through the gate and was saying, like, you need to, you need to leave and stuff. And Josh was, like, trying to get aggressive and Yusuf was almost trying to calm down, saying, right, let's go, let's leave it. Um, Although Yusuf was a much nicer person, Yusuf was also, like, going to parties, threatening people with Josh. I don't feel like that hasn't really been addressed. Why would they come to fight? Like, people would call them roadmen and stuff, but obviously they're all rich kids, and maybe they felt insecure about that and wanted to beat people up to prove to themselves that they were, like, who they wanted to be. Take care, then. Bye. 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 <sighs> Josh is definitely part of a scene, isn't he? He's part of some kind of scene. And what I think the biggest sort of curveball that I wasn't expecting him to come out with was that Josh was part of a crew, you know, that would go around and get into fights with people, and they seem to have been happening a lot. So Josh's alleged behaviour, although surprising, could be explained as the teenage male bravado that I'd been hearing so much about. But then something hit my inbox that felt entirely different. I've just been sent a confidential police report by one of my sources. It's a police review of everything that they've learned after their investigation into the Mackie case. And at a first glance, it's looking to me like something happened involving Josh in Wimslow. Could this be the incident linked to the knife possession and stolen property charges that Josh was about to return to court for? 
So this report is really interesting. On the night of Sunday, the 17th of February, that's 13 days before Yusuf was killed, three incidents took place here in Wimslow. There were two street robberies and an assault. The assault happened right over there in the Subway sandwich shop. And the street robberies happened nearby, one at the leisure centre and another one down the road. A large group of teenagers who matched the descriptions of the suspects were spotted running away, getting into a taxi and driving away from the area. The police pulled over a taxi for a stop and search. There's a big group of lads in the taxi and one of them is Joshua. Bolna was found in possession of a black balaclava. It said that there was a knife and some drugs were seized from the rear of the taxi. So there's no evidence to suggest that Josh was directly involved in those muggings, but Joshua was arrested. According to this police report, they took the knife out of the taxi, but the policeman showed what's described as little appetite to take the lads into custody. The police officer then de-arrested Joshua and let him walk free. Two of Josh's mates later gave evidence to the police that he was involved in this subway attack. And the report goes on to say that there was a lack of professional curiosity to understand the full picture as to how and why Josh was connected to these three incidents. In the report, the police admitted that they should have done more on the night of the Wimslow incident. But I needed to understand why they didn't. So I'm heading down to meet one of my old family friends, Martin. He was a really senior officer at Greater Manchester Police for 30 years. He's also the guy that introduced me to Doreen Lawrence and set me on a path to becoming a journalist. Hello. Long time no see, stranger. How are you? So nice to yeah. see you. Long time no see. I know, welcome literally back. years. Yeah, welcome back. I know. Martin's retired now, but he's the closest thing I've got to a police insider. And one thing I know about R. Martin is he isn't afraid to say what he really thinks. I wanted to run something by you, because I've been sent this report related to um, the Yusuf Mackey case and the offender Josh who killed Yusuf was stopped and searched in Wimslow 13 days before. He had a balaclava on him. He was in a big group of lads and there was um, a knife and a bag of drugs in the taxi that he was stopped in. But this report describes that the police had a lack of professional curiosity to, to deal with the incident and Josh that day. What does that mean, that phrase, lack of professional curiosity? Basically, it means he didn't do the job. If, if you stop a vehicle and you've got people in that vehicle with masks, with weapons, with drugs, then straight away you've, you've got enough powers there to do a lot more about it. There's a law against possession of a blade instrument. If you've got a knife, you've got balaclava and you've got drugs, I can see no reason why people weren't taken to a police station. So you could do a full investigation of who they are, what they're doing there and what's taking place. You could de-arrest later. Why do you think the police that day in Wimsow had a lack of professional curiosity to deal with Josh? Um, biased by the officers. If you are working in an area such as this uh, and you come across a person from this area, you're more inclined to believe in the innocence of that person as opposed to the guilt of that person. So your questioning is based on these aren't really bad kids. If lad in Moss Side had been caught with exactly the same knife, mask and drugs, then your presumption is they are bad kids, this is deliberate and I've got a gangster, I'm going to deal with it as a more serious type incident. There'd be at least um, checks made on, on the person, and um, there could be people, you know, caution, charged with possessing those weapons. And, and lots of officers say that's, that's good policing, whereas in Hale, that's not the case. It's a rarity that you actually look at something and think, you know, I need to turn that kid over even though he's in a car with a knife and a mask and drugs. How does that make you feel as, you know, a former black officer that spent all his career fighting this kind of bias? In terms of policing, yeah, we, we, the police do lots of, of diverse training and, and loads and loads of, of really, really good officers. But in, if you're looking at what takes place today, you wouldn't associate people from Hale, um, Old the Edge, Wilmslow as being part of, you know, a, a gang culture that doesn't exist in these places. 
When you police places like Moss Side, then you, you probably work on the basis that there's gang involvement. So the whole system is um, bias in, in favour of privilege. Even by Martin standards, this was strong stuff. I got in touch with the local police force and they told me they do and always will police without fear or favour. But could Martin be right that when it comes to teenage knife crime, unconscious bias was affecting the outcomes of young men in different parts of my city? Knife recovered after moss side stabbing as teen remains in serious condition in hospital. Tensions are rising between gangsters from Manchester's notorious moss side. Unfair to say notorious moss side. If you believe the headlines, knife crime in Moss Side is almost exclusively gang related. There is just so many incidents I've got up here of stabbings, retaliation stabbings, bloodthirsty gangs. Another one, police believe a feud between two South Manchester gangs is behind the outbreak of violence in Moss Side, including two murders. And when you read kids are running each other over, ambushing each other, stabbing each other to death in the streets where there's such a tight-knit community, it sounds like a war zone. But the language in these headlines just doesn't reflect the moss side that I know and I love. This is the community where my grandparents moved to when they first came to the UK. And it's the spot where my dad set up his first businesses. Why do you think we're not your friends? Through experience. A lot of the time when we talk to the press, it's never positive. The sad thing is that even with all my local connections, the majority of people around here just don't want to speak to journalists like me anymore. I don't want to say nothing. But in the same way, yeah, that you don't want this area to be portrayed as negative, right? I'm just here to do my job. It's just spreading rumours. Nobody want to help nobody if that's the way how people are going to portray things. Sad. The whole situation is sad. There was one story, though, breaking across Moss Side that felt different. Three families from the area were fighting back against the gang narrative and challenging their son's convictions. The families all believe that their sons had been wrongly convicted of a gang-related stabbing back in 2016. They'd even managed to convince a high-profile barrister to fight their case. The original trial centred around what looks like a really senseless killing of an 18-year-old named Abdul Hafida. Abdul was stabbed to death by one lad, a 19-year-old called Devonte Cantrell. And Devonte was convicted of his murder but six other teenagers were also convicted of the same charge and another four for the manslaughter of Hafida. They were sentenced to a total of 168 years. So how do 10 teenagers all end up in prison for the killing of someone they didn't stab? Well, the answer is a law called joint enterprise. Joint enterprise means that you can be convicted of someone else's crimes if it can be proven that you assisted or encouraged the offence. But the families of Nathaniel J. Williams, Friano Walters and Darrell Goodall are adamant that their sons were not part of a gang or a joint enterprise and should never have been charged with, let alone convicted, of murder. Hi, yeah, is that Cordell? Tamba here. We are just around the corner now, so she'll be with you in about four or five minutes. Cordell is actually there the night that Abdul Hafida was murdered. He was arrested and charged in connection with it. Cordell was later cleared of any wrongdoing, but his younger brother, Riano, was found guilty and was serving 20 years. I wanted to know why he was so sure that his little brother wasn't part of a gang, like the prosecution had alleged. In what happened to Abdul Hafida, just try and take me back to that night. Obviously, Rihanna was there. Um, 
through friends. Abdul, he appeared. Abdul was armed himself. Um, from what I know, I think two or three others were armed. And before I knew it, everyone was running. My brother was running. And I was hearing knife, 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 knife. And that, for me, was just a big thing. So we kind of, like, went after them. And the more and more I was following, the more and more it was going further and further and further. And I realised this is serious. And I remember I looked at my brother and I actually stopped him and said, come on, like... This is going to get serious, we need to go. But unfortunately, my brother stopped and turned around to see what was going on. And that was basically his implication in everything, ultimately, because they said that he was actively participating because he was on camera, seen on the corner, looking at what was going on. And obviously, eventually, from Victor of murder. Mm. It sounded like Abdul Hafid was very much hunted down. He was cornered and attacked when he was basically on his own. You can see how on the surface that would suggest it's gang violence. It's easy to fall into the trap of believing that. Um, the narrative that he was being hunted down, again, is through the media, the prosecution and the police. The easiest way to tie it all up is to say, no, you are all hunting him down, you are all the same, you all wanted the same end goal. Uh, my brother isn't a murderer and I can categorically say he didn't murder anybody, people could say, yeah, there was part of an enterprise. But in my opinion, nobody in that group foresaw that was going to happen. And the rest were just, like, bystanders to what was going on. I'm listening to police. They're telling us in the court the Rush Home Crips and AO Gang is a live thing. I know when the trial came up, AO was mentioned a lot. As far as I knew, AO was a music group when I was growing up, there was loads of, like, music crews and groups and stuff, and it was never really labelled as gangs because you kind of knew who the actual gangs were. I feel like now, especially since the introduction of drill music, it's easier for the police to say, well, these drill groups or these music groups are all part of gangs, and if you mention gangs, it makes it sound, like I said, more sophisticated, it makes it sound more premeditated. I feel like the thing that comes with my side is... Once you're labelled as being from there, you kind of have a stigma attached, so you're always the underdog. And do you think that played a part in this case as well? Majorly, yeah, definitely. And I wanted to know if Cordell and his brother's experience was an example of the unconscious bias Martin had talked about. I was hoping that the court transcripts might provide some answers as to how the prosecution were able to prove this so-called gang affiliation. During the trial, the prosecution called a witness from Greater Manchester Police's gang task force, which is called Excalibur. And according to this officer, AO were a bit more than just a music group. According to him, they were a street gang from Moss Side and that all of these defendants, he said, were part of this gang. The evidence that they used to prove this was showing who these lads hung out with and where, what these boys posted on their social media and what were the messages that were on their mobile phones. A music video was shown called Active. When you watch it, you see the word AO right at the very start. Big movements this year. Tell them, my Gs, tell them, tell them, tell them. You know what it is. Me and D was out there, yeah, we were taking my door. Then we got locked up, now we're flipping them old. And this officer told the jury that one of the main rappers in this video, this guy Don Flames, was now in prison for stabbing a mate of Abdul Hafida a year before. He said that this was not an innocent music video, but evidence that AO were a gang. He then went on further to say that the 11 defendants all had some connection to either this music video or the people that were in it. Some of them were seen in the video, while others had AO symbols and videos on their phones. When it came to Cordell's brother, Riano, who had no previous convictions, the evidence of his affiliation to AO were AO symbols and other images on social media, text messages, and a photo of him standing next to that rapper, Don Flames. 
But Rihanna's legal team are now arguing that the evidence that showed that AO were a gang and that Rihanna and the other defendants were potentially in that gang was not only thin, but that it was potentially biased. As I looked further into this issue, I came across a recent study that looked into legal appeals similar to Rihanna's, and it found that the majority of defendants in trials where music and music videos were used as evidence were young black men. Approximately half of the cases in the study were for joint enterprise offences. I wanted to know how rappers in the Manchester drill scene felt about their music being used in court to prove gang affiliation. Look, I'm in Gotham City. Hello, you LD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you, I'm Amber. How are you doing? Nice to meet you, I'm good, I'm good. Look at that view. LD's a rising star here, and he invited me around to his gaff to meet his team, Fidel, Marcel, and his manager dialing in from Dubai. Hello, big boss. (laughs) (laughs) He's in Dubai right now people expressing their lives. That's what drill music is. It's people talking about the stuff that they live. Yeah, it's just... And that's why it's referred to as gang music. Yeah. Some people have committed some crimes and snitched on themselves in their music, and that has been used to convict them. But now, because they've seen so many cases of this happening and being and being able to use this in a court of law now, if now a person who may not live the life they portray in their music now goes and raps this stuff and they somehow manage to get into trouble, that music would then be used against them, some do put out disclaimers. If they don't, it's uh, handing the police a confession, say, yeah, arrest me. I wouldn't allow my artists to be saying things like, um, you know, I stabbed this person, I'm going to shoot this person, and, you know, them types of things there, they can't be in any of our tracks, and... To be honest, the artists that I'm dealing with, they don't live that lifestyle, so I don't expect that to be inside of their lyrics. Anyway. Have you ever had situations where the police have used videos and maybe it's, like, featured as evidence in, like, cases or anything like that? Um, no, not for any of my artists, no. I was involved in a situation that, that was a factor. You were involved in one? I was proven innocent of all um, suspected guilt. So you were, what, stood in a video? Um, there was a death of someone we know. It was, quote-unquote, gang-related. And um, the police used that as evidence in the courtroom to suggest that because I'm at a funeral of a family member and I'm, I'm seen with these types of people that they deem to be criminals, that I must also be associated. How does that actually make you feel that you've been at a funeral the next minute you're in a court case because of it? Um, to be honest, I'm not surprised. Like, when you're from a specific area or grow up a certain way around certain types of people, there's so many different cases I've heard where this has been a factor. Before I left, I had one more question. I wanted to know what the guys felt about how Josh was portrayed at the murder trial. It's white privilege at play because he's got access to parents with certain types of um, resources. Let's be honest, money is at play, social status is at play, class is at play, white privilege is at play. My time in Manchester was coming to an end. What had brought me home was the killing of Yusuf Mackey. It was a case that had shocked everyone I knew because of where it happened and who was involved. What made me stay was a bigger story about class and race. I've learned that what you wear, how you talk, what music you listen to can be seen as silly fantasy in one part of town, but evidence of criminality in another. Yusuf Mackey... Mahmoud, Muhammad, and Abdul Hafida were teenagers all stopped in their prime. But they're not the only victims in this epidemic. If we want to solve the problem of knife crime, first, we really need to understand it. And maybe we need to stop labeling the young men of Manchester 
and start listening to them instead. Before I packed my bags, there was one last court case I had to attend. Josh Mulner had originally been charged with possession of a knife and stolen property. Since I'd seen him at Stockport Magistrates though, the prosecutors had dropped the knife charge on the grounds of insufficient evidence. So now he was just facing a stolen property charge. There was a really violent mugging of a young lad and he had his phone stolen, some money stolen, and he got beaten up quite badly and it was by a big group of lads. That iPhone that was stolen off him somehow ended up in Josh's possession. Now remember, this was the same night that Josh and his friends were subject to a stop and search where a knife, drugs and a balaclava were found in their taxi. The judge said he couldn't he couldn't explain whether Josh was a part of that attack and that robbery or not, but he knows that it came into his possession by illegitimate sort of uh, ways, to use his words. So Josh pleaded guilty to that and accepted that he was in possession of a stolen phone. And he's been told that for the next 12 months, if he commits any kind of offence, he could end up in prison. The judge made a few comments that um, Josh's youth worker gave him quite a glowing report, saying he's really turned his life around over the past two years. And I could see his mum like really nodding in agreement. And I did manage to snatch a few little conversations with them just to sort of properly introduce myself, because I've never really been able to do that. Um, I just feel like his voice is missing in all of this. Maybe one day we'll find out what was really going on in Josh's world. You got horns like devils and your teeth in me. You're on a whole nother level. Things you do to me. You got a hard blade of metal, lover and an enemy. Baby, you never try to change me. Oh, Ooh, you bleed black when it feels right. I don't gotta think twice Ooh, So long that it feels right